So thank you, thank you very, very much for agreeing to come and meeting with us. Um, you've all met me, but my name is Andrew Spencer. I'm a landscape architect with VME Associates. Um, and VME, and Robert Jones is also a landscape <laughs> architect with our firm. He's my comrade, if you will. Um, VME Associates was retained by the town to uh, kind of initiate the uh, conceptual master planning for the Shadow Pines project. Um, and then we have been retained by the town to do a few other items on the parkland. Uh, one being the Northeast Quadrant, which is uh, more of the recreational facility uh, where we would have things like uh, tennis courts, pickleball courts, um, uh, open pavilions, restrooms, and also athletic fields. I call them athletic fields. Basically a lawn panel that people are able to go out and kick a soccer ball, a football, play frisbee, things of that nature. Not an organized soccer fields or football fields, anything of that nature. Um, so we've been, we've been working on that with the town now for a number of months. Uh, the conceptual master plan was done, goodness, uh, Last year, August 19th, 2020, we actually prepared the plan that you see here, uh, as well as a, a short report um, of all of the recommendations that came out of the Shadow Pines Advisory Committee. And we basically took those items and elements and kind of boiled them down to how do they fit on the site. Um, so what we have is a master plan, concept plan that the town is is trying to make and facilitate and make it a reality. Um, right now, we actually have um, the Rochester, uh, the Greater Rochester Disc Golf Association working on the disc golf course on the property and the town is working with them. They've actually cleared some of the land for 18 holes of, of disc golf up on the north side of the property, uh, right adjacent to where the Clark, Clark House was. And actually the, uh, the first tee box will be right off of the parking lot behind the Clark House and all 18 holes are in that location. Uh, that northeast quadrant that I was talking about up here, that is, that is the recreational area uh, with, the, with the athletic fields and pavilion, bathrooms, things of that nature. So, Kind of as an overall consensus from the advisory group, they wanted to have multimodal, multi-use trails throughout the entire Shadow Pines property. We have all of the existing golf path network that exists today. Um, then we're actually, we, the town will be installing other path networks to connect some that don't connect. Uh, we have asphalt paths that sometimes just end at where a former, um, um, a hole began? Yeah, a fairway, a fairway began and then carts were off on the lawn. Uh, it is the intent that some of the connections will be made between those, those as asphalt trails. And so we'd have a, a full trail network. And those are to be used by everybody. Um, bikers, strollers, everybody. Um, family, family affair type of thing. So um, try to make them eight to 10 feet in width so they can accommodate a number of different users. Um, and one of the, I think one of the focuses from the advisory committee, and I think we've put within the, the master plan is that all of these trails should be and will be open to people that are biking. Um, I think we see a lot of opportunity for teaching kids how to bike, for example. They can get on an asphalt trail someplace with their parents and be able to ride around on relatively level ground. And the north area is very, very level except for the western portion. Uh, there's a rise and it comes back down again. Um, for the most part, all the, all the network is, is relatively flat. On the southern side is where we start to get some of the fun. Uh, there's a lot more hills down on that southern side. Has everybody been out there and walked and familiar with, with the site? Yeah. So the intent kind of of the south side is a little bit more, um, I'll call it a little bit more intense, um, only because we have some hills. Um, 
but we see that cross-country skiers, snowshoe uh, enthusiasts, uh, individuals of that nature most likely will be going to the southern portion because there's a lot more uh, terrain to, to have some fun with. Um, but what we've also done is we took a quadrant of the park, which is that southwest quadrant, it's approximately 35 acres in size. And that is to be quote unquote, um, an area for mountain biking in a true trail sense. Um, not the not a hard asphalt trail or a crushed stone trail, but more as a you know, a dirt trail situation. There's a lot of different terrain that exists down that southwest nature, that uh, southwest quadrant that we're going to have to contend with. Um, but we feel that that would be the quote unquote true mountain biking portion. Okay, so. Today, tonight, um, what we would like to try to get out of you folks is kind of your thoughts on each one of you kind of represents a little bit of a different entity, if you will. Uh, that's why you've all been invited here. Uh, so that we can kind of get your input, uh, get an understanding of what it is you want, what you, you desire out of a mountain biking area, um, and then somehow see how all of it can fit together. I will say, I, I, I need to make this comment, the town board has voiced on a number of different uh, occasions that they would like to see the entire park open for everybody to use, not for a specific user only. This needs to be open for the entire community to be able to enjoy. Um, we do have, and I know that there are mountain biking parks that are out there, the Dryer Road down in Victor. We've got um, Tryon Park uh, that is it's a little bit more intense in some of those trails. I'm not suggesting that we wouldn't get some of those in here, but we have to keep aware that this needs to be for everyone here in the community. Um, you're also going to have walkers down there. That's another thing. We're, we're going to got to talk a little bit about safety. Uh, what opportunities we have, how we can create a safe environment for both the bikers and pedestrians. Um, you know, I can see you know, small kids are going to be out there with the with the twenty year olds and and us uh, enjoying those same trails. So we have to make sure that we have some way of informing an individual before they go down a trail. What is this? Um, I think the supervisor at one point said, I don't think we want any black diamond trails. So that was a little bit of the commentary. Um, so with that, I would love to open it up to each and every one of you kind of initially to give us some input about who you represent. You're here as part of an organization. That's why you were invited. But I'd like to get out of all of you kind of where you're from, what it is that you're looking to get out of a mountain biking area so that we can try to put all the pieces together. Jim, did you have something? Uh, Jim Costello, Town of Penfield. I'm just here as a uh, innocent bystander. Um, but if, you, if you're going to speak, please speak into the uh, microphone so they can, they can record your voices so they can keep a record of what we're talking about, okay? Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Awesome, thank you. So I don't, I, we didn't pick straws when we walked in here, so I open it up to whomever would like to volunteer first. I, I'd be happy to start. Uh, so my name is Eric Metzler. Um, I'm a town of Penfield resident. I, I live down um, off of Five Mile Line Road. Um, so where to start on all the different hats I wear. Um, I've been mountain biking for 20 years, 21 years now. Um, and my two uh, children, 10 and 12, uh, both have, have kind of gotten into it, my 10 year old especially. Um, I am a board member on Grok um, and have, have been on, on and off the board a couple of times over the last uh, 15 years. Um, I've helped with uh, uh, trail work um, as well as uh, I'm a uh, certified mountain bike instructor um, and I, I did that uh, even 
um, professionally on, on the side uh, for a few years as well, uh, which is a really great experience. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm on the property every other day, uh, walking or running um, or cross country skiing in the winter. Um, so I, I like to get out there a lot. I'm, I'm uh, just under a mile from, uh, from one of the, the entrances. So um, yeah, I get over there a lot. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, oh, also I was on the, uh, let's see if I get this right, the Shadow Pines Land Use Advisory Committee. Uh, which is a mouthful, uh, but we were the, the committee that um, helped uh, come up with the recommendations for how to use the property um, after it had been purchased um, by Penfield. And uh, my interest here is really just to, um, you know, to see where we can get some more, uh, I would say, like beginner friendly um, kind of trails. My vision for this has always been a little bit of the model of, of what is up at Whiting Road, um, where there is some wider, very, very beginner kind of trails up there that uh, walkers and riders um, can easily pass each other on those trails. Um, but then there's a few other uh, trails that get a little bit uh, more difficult, uh, a little bit narrower and um, uh, require, uh, you know, a little bit more trail design to make sure that there isn't conflict between uh, between users, but it works very, very well there. And that's really the only park that we have in the area that kind of, that has that like rank beginner um, kind of experience where the speeds aren't really high, uh, people are not looking for obstacles or um, any, of, any of the like the really technical riding experience and are just looking to be able to get out on dirt, you know, off of, off of the canal path, off of the road uh, to ride their bikes. Um, and I mean, that's where I started my kids riding when they were just a few years old, you know, before they could really get their bikes over any kind of obstacles or anything like that. So um, I'd like to see uh, more of that. And as I left for the meeting tonight, my, my 10 year old's like, oh, where are you going tonight? And I said, well, we're going to talk about trails at Shadow Pines. He's like, all right, more trails that I can ride. Um, so he's, you know, he's, he's very excited about that. Um, I think it will be a little bit of a challenge in the area that we're talking about, there is some very steep terrain that is e even beyond what you would want to ride as, as like black diamond kind of terrain. So it is going to be a little bit of a challenge to figure out how to route trails through there so that it can be beginner or inter intermediate friendly. But um, I, I definitely uh, appreciate uh, the town being open to having um, that much of the property open to some more, um, I don't want to say mountain biking specific, but mountain biking oriented trails. Um, so that's great. One other thing that I've also seen that has been a huge success at Dryer Road Park, and I would love to see at more parks around here is both the pump track and the skills area um, that, uh, that is there. If you go there on any day of the week, there's, there's people just all over um, those features and, and riding those. And I think that's something that we need more of around here. There are people who will drive an hour to get to a good pump track. Um, so it's, it's the kind of thing that will help draw people to our area as well. Uh, can, I, can I just ask a question about yeah. the, the pump track and the skills area? Could you just expand a little bit on what those are? Yeah, so a pump track is a, is a, like an oval shaped um, course, I guess, if, if you want to call it, that might be, uh, I don't know, tens of feet across, maybe 60, 80 feet long. Um, and it basically has a series of, of dirt um, rollers where you can, um, you can get on your bike and you can ride around it. And the idea is to be able to, uh, to pump your bike. You don't actually pedal it. So it teaches you some good uh, riding uh, body position uh, technique as well as it just, you know, you spend five minutes going around that, around a pump track, uh, trying to not pedal and just pump on the backsides of, of each of these rollers. Um, it, it can be quite a workout. So it's, it's a great way to just, uh, just get another aspect of being on being on a bike. But people who have mountain bikes can do it. People who have BMX bikes can do it. So it also gets a, a wider variety of riders. People who may be intimidated about going out and riding miles on trails, even though they might go out and do 50 laps of a pump track and end up riding, you know, 
two or three miles anyway. Um, but it, it's just another attraction for, um, for riding that is something that does not take up a ton of space um, and uh, you know, can accommodate, again, people who don't, you know, don't have a geared mountain bike, don't necessarily want to get out on those trails. A skills area would be a similar kind of thing uh, for just building basic skills uh, for being on a bike, like having um, log rollovers in a much more controlled situation. So when you talk about having an area where people can learn to ride, it is far easier for them to learn in a much more controlled manner rather than encountering, uh, say, a log over on it. So a log over is you have a log going across the trail and um, you need to negotiate getting your bike over that log in order to keep moving rather than stopping and getting off and walking over it. Um, but if you only see one every five, 10 minutes on a trail versus having a progressive series of more difficult log rollovers in a controlled area where you can just practice it over and over and over again, um, it, it makes that learning experience much, much faster. And somebody can even just spend you know, 20 minutes doing that and then go out and ride a trail and is gonna be able to ride a whole lot of features that they weren't able to do before that. Um, but then there's, there's other features uh, in there as well uh, that will help people learn uh, in a, again, in a controlled manner, uh, some of the features that they would learn on a bike, or that they would, enc would encounter on a bike trail. So. And where, where would you, in, you've been out to the site, you yeah. know that we've taken that 35 mm -hmm. acres, it actually stretches basically from Clark Road down to that southwest mm -hmm. quadrant. Um, if you were to put out a skills area in a pump track, where where might you situate that? In in the area that is marked out, um, I wish I knew the the old uh, uh, green or the whole numbers on there. But the uh, I guess the area that starts closest to Clark Road, because um, uh, no over to the uh, to the east of that yeah that area. Um, so the terrain is, is more gentle there. Uh, in general, you're gonna want a pump track to be in a flatter area um, because if you have too much uh, elevation change going uphill, you, can't, you just can't pump the bike enough to get enough speed to get up that. So it wants to be in a relatively flat area. The skills area can certainly make use of some amount of elevation change because if you can coast while you're trying to negotiate some of these obstacles, then it also it eliminates the need to add pedaling to the, um, you know, to that. Uh, as far as like, it just makes the the learning experience a little bit easier. Uh, but you can make some uphill obstacles as well. Um, so having a little bit of grade change is is good. Um, most of the rest of the area, I think, uh, would be would be tough to do because a uh, the terrain is too steep for any of this stuff, but also. B, it's not close to a parking lot. So if there's, you would wanna have a parking area very close by, not that it has to be next to the parking lot, but within a few hundred yards so that um, you know people are able to easily ride to it to be able to do that stuff and they don't have to go ride two miles down a trail to be able to get to it. Right, I think right now it's anticipated that the parking area near the Clark House would facilitate a number of different users in the entire site. Um, there are some parking areas that are being proposed, one of which may be near where the barn is. And I think the area that you're speaking of is between the 10th tee and the 18th green. Um, that area is near the barn area, um, and that's where it's relatively level until you get a little bit yeah. further out. Yeah. So even if there wasn't a parking lot there yet, just parking at the main, um, parking area and just crossing Clark Road would would certainly be sufficient for getting into that area. Great. Awesome, thank you very You're much. Welcome. See, we had a nice volunteer for the first round. Who's number two? <laughs> I can speak. Hi. Hi. Is this on? Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm Laura Church and I represent the Rochester Bicycling Club. Um, we're a club of primarily road cyclists, but we also do some rail trails and some gravel roads. Um, and I'm a road cyclist, but I'm also a mountain biker. And um, I've also done some mountain biking instruction as well. 
Um, and I've been mountain biking for about nine years now. Um, but uh, I guess what I would say from the RBC perspective, I have a lot of road cycling friends that um, are interested in mountain biking and I try to take them out on our local mountain biking trails and you know what we have is mostly pretty technical for beginner riders so I would just echo uh, Eric what you were saying that um, it would be really helpful for us to have some more beginner oriented trails um, and also full disclosure my fiance is a professional trail builder <laughs> so <laughs> um, over the last few years I've gotten to travel around the country and see some you know, what kind of what can be done. And um, I think the kind of trail that would be really great to have would be like four foot wide um, trail that's in the woods that isn't rail trail, isn't flat and straight, goes up and down and side to side where you're really in the woods, but it's safe um, and accessible to a, a larger you know, portion of the population. Um, and I think, I think it would be nice, um, I like the idea of, of having a skills park so people can, you know, work on their sk little skills area. But I think it's also nice, I've seen trails that have optional technical trail features um, that are integrated into the trail. So it's sort of like that next step. Um, you know, in our tight single blue single track, that we have locally, there are a lot of forced trail features that, um, you know, can be kind of scary and, and dangerous, really, if you're a beginner rider and you come across them. But there's a way to build them into the trail that it's optional and safe. And um, so I are think the, these like a pull-off area. Not a pull-off area. It's sort of like you could ride around them, or you could ride over the pile of rocks. And the pile of rocks is built in such a way where if you kind of get stuck, you can put a foot down and not break your arm or um, a drop where you can, it's a small drop. Like <laughs> you know, a lot of times I think, you know, locally, the people who are most motivated to build trails locally are people who've been riding a long time. And um, so they tend to build features that are pretty extreme. <laughs> and, and as somebody who's like a little more intermediate like myself, it's, it'd be nice to have some more, you know, one foot drops to practice on in the trail. <laughs> and. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say is um, in order to do this, like with the steep slopes that are, that are in this area, um, it's helpful to build it with machines. Um, because you just, in order to get that wide bench and in order to, you know, have it be sustainable and shed water and have good sight lines um, to move the amount of earth that you need to move, machines really help and the machine built trail that I've ridden has been just amazing. I think that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. that input. Hi, I'm Chelsea Wall. Um, I facilitate um, a, a group called Roots and we are 160 strong our first year. Um, I had a goal a year ago to have a young ladies group. Um, and so I talked to a lot of representatives at um, Little Bella's. And they are a national organization that won't approve where the youth ride if there isn't enough flow trail that's green. So I thought a lot about this in the last year, um, even though I did not become a Little Bella's chapter. Um, so I also come to you as an inclusion ambassador. Um, I work with Anita, um, and I also am a member of GROC. Um, so I would say also listening about the green trails. Um, as mountain bikers, we talk a lot about the flow. <laughs> and um, I've come across um, this concept of looking at different lines similar to how mountain climbers might. So to piggyback on what Laura was saying, when, when we are on the trails, we're looking at like the most fun line or the most technical line or the most flowy line. And sometimes we'll spend like 20 minutes with the kids or more just sessioning one spot and trying different ways to ride it technically correct. Um, 
So we have 10 groups that meet um, two, twice a week. And we have kids as young as four. And we have one role model who is 75, I think. And the kids are set up by skill level and by age. And we have two role models per group. So each week we hope that 20 adults show up, but there are 45 adults that are background checked to meet with us. So, I mean, I can speak to the same thing that we just heard about, the pump track, which is you can see any age kid on the, or adult on that pump track. Like people will come to the park literally just to bring their race car, their little electric race cars, their scooters, their brand new bike with a basket, <laughs> or their full suspension mountain bike. So those pump, the pump track really is a draw. Um, in fact, we use it as an incentive. <laughs> we, we don't start the rides with the pump track because we don't get the kids off of it. <laughs> um, when I am picturing flowy green trails, um, I am picturing um, some other places that have been like that, like the north end of Chautauqua Lake. Don't remember what, that, what those trails are called, but um, do you? Is that Harris Hill? Is that Harris Hill? No, um, it's, uh, it's, a it's a state park there, but there, there's a lot of flat, not too, not too hilly areas. Um, and usually I use a different kind of bike when I'm there, but it's great for kids. Um, another thing I've noticed, another thing I've noticed is if you're thinking about a wider, a wider trail, um, and then you're also thinking about wheelchair access, it's gotta be wide enough turns because one of the challenges we ran into really quickly at, at Dryer Road this year was that the trail we picked, while it seemed green, it, it's the, the current um, route is just too tight. Like it would take a full summer to work on that. So we, we thought we were gonna be able to like throw a modified bike on there, but we, we can't because it won't be safe. Um, so your, at your experience is <clears throat> a little bit of a wider trail gives you a little bit better opportunity for that particular rider? Yeah, because, I mean, think about way back to your first biking experience and then throwing trees, you know, <laughs> next to you. You're, it feels like you're going really fast. <laughs> um, so the other thing when I think about multi-users is I think about the bird watchers that we would see at Whiting Road. Um, and I also think about um, the maps that are at each juncture and um, naming the trails, really fun names. Um, that's really fun for kids <laughs> and people. Um, Cause I know that at some of the trails around here, we've, we all just give them our own names. <laughs> um, it's particularly like the the yellow flow trail or the lollipop trail, you know, whatever you can come up with their fun names would be great. Um, oh, and then in terms of parking, you said we would c cross Clark Road. How busy is that? Um. Well, I think during certain times of the day, it's far busier, uh, especially uh, at the end of school, beginning of school. Some people do cut down through that area to get to Wayland, to go north, to get to the middle school. Um, you know, the end of the day, the Clark, Clark Road could be relatively busy, but we are looking at, I mean, the golf course used to have a crossing for the golf carts. And we're actually considering utilizing that same crossing, more signage, pedestrian crossing, maybe even a flashing light type of situation uh, to try to slow vehicles down on Clark Road. Um, in the future, we do hope to actually get parking on the southern portion. And as I said, near where the barn is today, uh, we might actually be able to get a small parking field there. Uh, parking will be going further south on the property. Oh, 
In my experience, Chelsea, is it's not that bad to cross that road. Like, okay. it's harder than crossing Whiting Road, but it's like nowhere near trying to cross Browncroft. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it, there, there's history with that crossing, too. I mean, the golf course has been there for how many yeah. years, and that's the golf cart crossing area. And there used to be signs on both sides. So with proper signage, I think we can get people across there. But we are looking for parking down and maybe a proposed pavilion location here, as I said, near the, uh, the barn. This is the barn location, and maybe parking that might be right there. So you could get to this point and then get off. Chelsea, was that Stockton State Forest that you were referring to by Chautauqua Lake? Does that sound familiar? I, I believe it was Long Point. Long Point? Yeah. Okay. And those trails were not really built for mountain biking, but they're, practically speaking, functional for it. They're more or less uh, just eight foot wide forest trails, is my recollection. And I think we have, a, we have an a absolutely uh, awesome opportunity on the southern side here with all of the pre-existing trail network that is there, the cart paths, um, leaving a lot of those in place, we're gonna get greens and yellows by default because they come down the hills. Um, so we have a, quite a bit of elevational change there that I would see for, for kids would be a little bit more of a yellow trail type of situation. Uh, but all of the trail networks throughout the entire Shadow Pines property are gonna be open up for bikers, and I see that for the ability to do the, um, you know, the very level riding, you know, especially on the north side. We mm -hmm. keep a lot of the trails up there. Uh, that's flat land, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is really really nice. But and there is a proposed parking lot that's going to be going in up in that northern area. So I know everybody can't see this, but just as an overview, this is that northern portion of the north section of the Shadow Pines property. Um, we are proposing a parking facility here, a pavilion, and then this area is that open lawn concept here. So there is a starting point to get up to that point. We actually will have um, what's being proposed right now are children's play areas, playgrounds. Um, so the whole family can go there. There's picnic uh, area that's being proposed. So this is much more of a family gathering space. So this could also be utilized for some of the beginners. Um, you know, learn how to, this is what I said a little bit earlier, learn how to <coughs> bike in these areas where it's relatively level before you go down to the south, the south side where you get a little bit more terrain um, and you could get a little bit more technical trail. So. Yeah, keeping open green space is actually just as important, yeah, as everything else we're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I th from an overall, um, kind of from an overall concept, we want to allow the golf course to kind of grow back into itself, but grow back into it in a particular way. Right now we have an awful lot of invasive species that are out there that have just taken over. Um, and we do, uh, we do need to put a maintenance plan together uh, to have the town understand, eh, we're gonna have to brush hog this once every two years. We're gonna have to mow this once every two years to encourage the plant material that we want on the property and not let it go to all of the invasives. And that, that will provide all that open space that, that we're looking for too. I think cool. all of these things are gonna come together, little yeah. puzzle pieces. Have you guys talked to birders at all? <laughs> I, I've, um, I've talked to a number of different organizations. Yeah. I'm just curious because I just walking my dog in there, I've seen you know, all these new bird species to add to my, <laughs> my list. So it just seems like it's a great environment for that. Uh, anything other than a highly manicured, maintained lawn area that had pesticides, yeah. herbicides, <laughs> fertilizers on it, are gonna, you're going to see birds galore. Uh, even some of the dead trees, I've talked to town staff about this too, some of the dead trees have a dozen holes in them and we know it's woodpeckers in there, there have yeah. to be owls in that location, uh, the hawks are all over the place and it's, we're gonna see more and more and more of that I think as time goes on, which is really cool, which is really neat. As long as we don't hit any with our mountain bikes, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> 
So if I could expand on the comments that I've heard so far, uh, I'd say generally speaking, it sounds like what people are looking for is, as I referenced earlier in our conversation, mountain biking is a progression sport and really none of our local parks in Monroe County have what I would describe uh, as a well-built progression. And so effectively, I think what's what it sounds like the outcome more likely is going to be is that this park is going to be the area that you bring beginner and intermediate people to introduce them to mountain biking, and then they can graduate on to the other parks. There are beginner sections of the other parks, but they're very limited, generally speaking. Um, and then similarly, with the skills course and the pump track, in order to, I think, in order to make this park kind of a, a place that the whole family wants to go to, because if you have three kids and one of them's 15 and the other one's 13 and the other one's 10, well, the 10-year-old wants to be able to have fun and the 15-year-old wants to be able to have fun. And practically speaking, it's not too difficult to build in the skills course um, skills sections for advanced riders, because it doesn't take up a lot of space, uh, and skills sections for intermediate riders and skills sections for beginner riders. And then the, the, the easier paths for the green trails. And just, but on an, on an intermediate trail level, I think, I think it would be, I think we'd be foolish to not have kind of a intermediate and A line, B line options so that when somebody does come out here, and it's, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's Eric and his 10 year old son where um, Eric can have fun on the trail and his 10 year old son can have fun on the same trail. I mean, it's, it's really should be that, I say easy, it's, it takes a good trail designer, but it's all possible. Um, and then I'm sure Anita has lots of great ideas on how to incorporate her, uh, her goals here as well. Uh, on routes, when you show up with, which happens, 120 people and there's a parent or two in each car and a kid or two in each car, and let's say there's 30 or 40 or 50 cars that all show up within a 15 minute window, um, you need to have the parking to do that and you need to have the facilities to handle that and, uh, and everybody's kind of scrambling and going in different directions and it's common that maybe some kids are part of routes and some kids aren't. Um, I would suggest that you try to orient the skills area and the pump track area as close as you can to the parking lot as possible because it's common that the parents are hanging out at the parking lot and they're able to watch their younger kids do what they're gonna do on the skills area and the, and the pump track. If that's 300 yards down the way, the parents aren't gonna make it. I mean, it, just, it would just limit usage. It really is beneficial to have that as close to the parking lot as possible. Is that a parent drop off or do they stay in park? They'll stay in park and watch and you'll see, I mean, if you go to Dryer Road, you'll see 10 parents hanging out talking while they watch their kids do laps around the pump track. Um, you know, in a way it's almost a, a babysitter. Like you can't lose the kid, he's right there. And uh, <clears throat> the kid wears himself out. Like it's really effective. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think that's my summary. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just piggyback off of them because I'm wearing the same shirt as them. <laughs> um, so my name's Amanda Wickham and I am a new Penfield resident. I moved in November um, on Qualtro and I didn't know this was going to be a thing. <laughs> and I'm also a new mountain biker, so I found Chelsea riding a really beefy bike at a community ride that, um, so she was starting this women's group. Um, and I also have a five-year-old son who is, well, six now, um, who's riding. And he is the nervous kid, right? He wants to be out there um, and loves Whiting Road and feels really comfortable there but we ride there once a week. Um, and at now loves the pump track. We drove up to Buffalo. Um, there is Lakeside Park. I don't know if others have visited, um, but again, there's a pump track and a TOTS kids skills area. That was a lot of fun for the two of us. Very close to the, to the parking lot. Um, and then they also have, I think it's three trails there that are um, like single track, but they have like, 
I could ride a fun line of like a feature and my son could take a, a designed path around it. Um, and so I just highly support that because we both had fun um, and we got to do it together. And then we could stop and session something, right? So I could spot him. There was plenty of room. I wasn't at um, like Bay Park West where we're on the ledge and I really can't <laughs> navigate next to him. put a foot down and you go down a cliff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and Bay Park West is, you know, has some really fun flowy stuff, but it's so narrow that it's, and you, you know, if you're coming head to head to someone. Um, we bring a lot of people to these areas and I think that there is a huge, I don't think we're, we're gonna stop growing. Um, there are a lot of kids every time I'm somewhere and they hear that we're doing this, they're like, I'd love to give my kid that opportunity. Um, so the parking in, t in my mind is like something where I'm a little nervous about. Um, you know, when we go to Whiting Road and we don't normally have as many people come to Whiting Road, but they're parked along the road where it's a little bit of a hazard. Um, and then we have kids and people have dogs because. Our families do hang out in the parking lot, but sometimes they also hike um, and they explore other pieces of the park. I'm assuming with um, the other opportunities that are outlined here, that families may sneak over to the Frisbee area or the other walking areas. So these cars aren't gonna go anywhere. Um, and then there'll be other opportunities outside of routes that are going to be there if there's a soccer game, because that is, um, something that we ran into at the beginning of our season, you know, the lacrosse fields that are there. Um, it was, it's very packed at Dryer Road when you have 100 people plus everything else that's going on. Um, I, I want to emphasize the maps. Um, I am a new person and, you know, I don't ride by myself, but um, I always go with someone that I know. But when you're on a, a trail that doesn't have a name, and there's like seven trail intersecting and you're pulling up your phone and you're trying to, it's, it's dangerous. Um, and then if someone gets hurt, unfortunately, um, it's gonna be really hard for them to say where I am for a rescue crew to come in. Um, and then I think my last point is, I think it's great we have Grok that comes out with patrol um, stuff, but I think part of this conversation needs to also include our you know, local responders on how are they going to best respond to things. Um, there will be accidents. And um, how does that work? What materials do they need to get us out safely and timely? Um, and who are they going to call, right? And so I think about when I go hiking in the Adirondacks, you have a number that you call. You might not be able to reach it. I don't know what cell phone is going to be like in there. Um, and I think about beta trails that are in the Adirondacks. They just recently um, acquired a litter piece of equipment that can help carry someone out for an emergency. Um, and I think you know that took fundraising and grants, but we have a lot kind of in our area now. Um, and if it's, the trails will be hopefully accessible, but there will be accidents. And so um, continuing that conversation there. I think that's it. Could I, could I go back to another thing that you said earlier, which is that they are um, multiple use trails. Mountain bikers generally, well, almost every trail we ride is a multiple use trail. If we were to riding at a downhill park, it's not, but it, most of the trails we ride are all multiple use trails. Most mountain bikers know that they're supposed to yield to pedestrians, to walkers. Most mountain bikers do that, not all everybody. Um, but generally speaking, it's a, it's an accepted part of the process that our job as the people that are going fast on the trail need to take care of the people who are going slower than us. Yeah, and a properly built trail will have adequate sight lines so that you can, you don't have those blind corners, you'll be able to see if somebody's coming. Yeah, and then um, Whiting Road has multiple spots you can, you can um, take a break. There's some benches in there. I like that feature as well. Um, perhaps adding more than one station with um, repair tools. So Victor Park has one spot right at the parking lot, but maybe if there was a second, second spot. I'd like to jump in. Uh, I'm Anita O'Brien with Rochester Accessible Adventures. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm not a mountain biker. 
I, I do all things inclusion, inclusion of people with disabilities, and there's a lot of mountain bikers to be had in that category. And I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of what's already happening in our area and why this project, and especially how you're conceptualizing it as you know, not really a single track trail, um, would really work into this vision that we have. Um, some of you may know that Brian Emelson in Victor recently acquired an adaptive mountain bike. If you haven't tried it, I would encourage you all to. I think you'll love it. Um, it is an, inc he went, as he probably would, uh, to the max that he could get um, with suspension and it's e-assist, um, paying attention to people's shoulders that would be hand cycling. Um, and it's just a beautiful piece of equipment. The problem is we've got to progressively get people using it that maybe are used to the Erie Canal Trail on a regular adaptive cycle and want to move off-road safely. Um, so we've already had some conversations about what that might look like programmatically, but most important is if we don't have trails for people to progress, then it's a dead-end sport. Um, if we're looking at this as a tourist destination for trails, which a lot of the towns around here have lovely trails and tout that, um, we're in a tourist destination spot, we're already looking at adaptive mountain biking as one of those draws to the area. Again, though, for that, we need places where people can access the equipment so they don't have to try to put one of those bikes on the airplane. And also, um, have trails where they can use them. And so those are the kind of systems that I love. That's what we tackle is all the access points, all the issues around access. But you guys are the trail. You're like, you have this plot of ground and um, in a really great position, unique position to not try to revamp a trail after the fact so that it could be used, but do it now so that it's like perfect. If we can get a trail that's perfect in play. Um, there are so many things we can do to get more people accessing the sport that you love. And there's, you know, if you, if you spend, just as there are many different levels of bikes that you can buy, if you look at some of the adaptive equipment, there's anything from $7,000 to $27,000 worth of gear that you can get and pack into this, you know, into one cycle. So there's that level of, of interest. There's recreational, and then you're going to have your ultra. We don't have a lot of terrain around here that equals, you know, maybe the Moab Desert or some of the hills in North Carolina, but we can be a place where it starts, the dream starts for a lot of people. Um, and I love the idea of the wider trails with built-in integrated um, elements that would allow, if you're, if you're really truly conceptualizing it, that would allow, just as you talk about the kids, the five-year-old exploring, well, maybe they want just the path, the bare ground. But maybe the fifth time they go out, they're ready to ride a wheel over the rock pile. You know, these bikes are built to be in pretty precarious. If you watch any video of mountain bikers, adapted mountain bikers, they're equipped to do all of that stuff, um, but the user has to learn to do that. And I think that when you integrate your trail that way, with that kind of a design, then you're, you're just, I mean, all of you, I think, have spoken to that ability to, um, to have multiple levels of experience out there riding. And I don't know how many of you have ever looked at adaptive mountain bikes, um, ever tried one, ever thought about somebody using one, that's just because we really haven't had, I mean, I've been in cycling in Rochester for 20 years, but we haven't had an opportunity to bring people to that. Why would I offer it to them if they're not gonna be able to access it? Well, that's great, but you have to travel, you know, like way travel to get to that equipment or get to that kind of terrain. But we have this opportunity now to be able to bring people, um, you know, even in Brian's conceptualization in Victor, he's taking them out on the Lehigh Trail because it's not paved. That's a great start for off-road, right? Not paved. You can find some gravel. You can begin to negotiate different kinds of, of those elements that you've been talking about, maybe even a log somewhere. But they get to try the bike. And it sounds like in this conceptualization of this 
parcel. You could do all of that from the golf cart tracks, right, to grass, to gravel, to logs, to rocks, to boulders, whatever you want them to, to get to, in the same manner that you're allowing a five-year-old on a two-wheel bike to explore it. Um, the, there are standards for how those trails get designed. Um, my, I, I do try to research into the things that I work on, whether it's fencing or scuba diving or mountain biking. Um, it, what I have seen does support that sometimes the trails that are um, made with machinery end up being able to truly accomplish those kinds of standards that are in there. Um, again, I'm going a little bit into what I don't know, so I'm gonna put that back on y'all. But I do know that there are um, consultants that we can work with closely to make sure that, you know, it, it, you can pick a standard and try to go buy it, but what a pity if it doesn't work, because now you've gotta go back and reconstruct that turn or reconstruct your line or. Right, and yeah, so I mean, I would just say like, if you have the trails professionally designed and built, it's it's more money up front, but then you've got this quality product that's going to last, that's got an, not going to need to be revised, and it's just going to serve a broader uh, audience. Yeah, and I think we can train, because I know a lot of what we do in our, locally is volunteer-driven, you know, in terms of maintenance, and that, but we can train on that. You know, yeah. if, we get the, if we get it there first, then we can train everybody on how to maintenance and, and how to, what we're supposed to be looking for um, over the years as it progresses. So um, truly exciting on our side of the world in the disability realm where for years I've given people an uh, adaptive cycle option for a flat surface like the Erie Canal Way. But if we go off onto the grass, those bikes just aren't really built for that. But now we're starting to get them and when it comes to the funding of that, that's something our organization can get. We can put those bikes here. I just got a grant yesterday, or I got the application for a grant yesterday for large adaptive equipment, $40,000. And I was like, oh, I could buy three bikes, adaptive mountain bikes, but that's, that would quadruple what we have. So that's what we want to do, but I, I will do that when we have trails where we can develop the programming. You know, I wonder if that might be an opportunity for like fundraising and getting grants. I know, you know, when you team up with different organizations that it's grant funders like that. Mm -hmm. There's <laughs> and, tons of development trails yeah. for accessible types of access pieces. Yeah. So whether it's this kind of trail um, or a, you know, a kayak launch, all that's, that's what's really being pushed right now across yeah. all of the different, um, arenas, especially if it's public lands. And I, I would say, you know, if, and I haven't heard it today, anybody going to cost first, you know, is a barrier. But I think if we understand that if you go less than, you're gonna have to go back or it's, it's just not gonna be, you know, in five years, it's gonna lose its fun. It's just gonna be a path. And, you know, I, I think what we want, what I hear you talk about is something pretty significant in terms of the sustainability that you're looking for. I think that's it for now. Yeah, great, thank you very much, that's great. I, mean, I just wanna go off on a little bit of a tangent. <clears throat> Can we even get those users on the existing cart paths that are out there? Um, and especially, again, I, I, I point to the southern portion of this site um, and then even incorporating some of the elements that we've been talking about, can we actually utilize those asphalt paths and modify them as necessary where they're broken apart and put together a, a, a real trail? Those are already wider. Um, we may have to take a look at the design of those and see what the cross slopes are and all of the, per the criteria that we need to design to, but could we not put the elements along that path network as well? Um, that there's there a pile of rocks or that is there a, a, a curvilinear, you know, dirt section to that. When you're riding down that asphalt path, you get to turn off for 10 feet, 20 feet, and go and do that little ramp that goes around, and then you come back to the main trail to start. I think that's gonna be a hard sell. I don't know why you guys are, why everybody I don't else think is it, to, I don't think, it, if I'm understanding, not to replace the other idea of the wider trail being yeah 
not to the no I'm, I'm 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 trying to I'm, I'm I'm trying to make a suggestion. We might actually have something here that could actually be utilized right now. Well, I now. think that the cart, the, the cart paths, existing asphalt gar, cart paths are great for the very beginner piece that we're looking at. I also know that for this sport, people are looking to get off of asphalt. Yeah. They're looking to be well, on yeah. something that's It's like not too asphalt. easy, too boring. You can I, do well, it on I a road bike. I do love the idea of extending. <laughs> but I'm also, I, I, I'm also, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm speaking out loud, but I'm thinking out yeah. loud. This is also potentially an opportunity to bring the youngest riders that we have, the three, four-year-olds, oh, to yeah. bring them out onto the asphalt trail. And then all of a sudden we have a dirt trail that has a little bit of a jump to it or a little bit of a hump to it um, to give it a little bit more character. Not I think you're promoting mountain biking, off-road mountain biking by doing that. And I, th I think that that's a, a really fun approach. You know, it's kind of like I think if the trails were the exercise ones, you're walking along and that's all of a sudden thinking. there's a little exercise thing you can yeah. step off and do and then get back on your trail. I see it like that and I think it would be great. Um, I think it, from the adaptive mountain biking, as long as those elements are also adapt made purposefully, strategically for the adaptive cycles. Um, and then I think as long as um, you're not thinking to do that it, instead of wider paths throughout the rest of it, I think that sounds kind of fun to have stations. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, let, let Doug speak and whoever mm -hmm. else wants to speak here too. Um, um, but I, you know, all these ideas, I think we can pull and wrap together in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think we can have a two, we can have a single track that goes down through a portion of it. We can have that wider trail that has all these other elements to it. Uh, so we, it could be a wide array of, wide array of, of, of approach. Uh, I'm not the expert, I'm just thinking. Yeah. I'm, a, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a thinker. I think just from my perspective, and, and not necessarily being involved there, but I think it's important for me as a parent to have my son doing the same, th and, and having people of different abilities doing the same thing as my son. So I think that's really important to me as a parent that he sees people of all abilities, ages, look all different, but we're all able to do it too. Like I don't want, I, I want him to come across the trail and see someone that is in a different type of bike and, and doing that. So I want, I want it to be together still. So it's important to me as a parent. So housing that is important. So the square footage to house those bikes is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, too, like wh wherever your tool shed is, can that have a little bit of extra square footage to house the bikes that get rented out to do that? At, no. at Lakeside in, or whatever it's called at, in Buffalo, they have bike rentals right there. Um, and, and like a little pizza and drink place that I thought was really cool. You want me to talk? Would you, I don't would have you anything like to. to say. Uh, <laughs> Douglas Sharp, RV and e-bike and skate. Uh, all I do is like to see you guys come in and buy stuff, and then I fix your product, and then you're back out riding the trails again. But no, in all seriousness, um, the just letting people know where they can go ride. There's so many people that come into our store, both in Fairport or Canandaigua, and they go, "Well, can I ride my mountain bike somewhere?" Like the they don't, they don't even know where to go once you've, <clears throat> even if you're trying to sell them a bike, you're like, I oh, can go down the canal path, which we saw a lot of high risks to go down the canal path, but to go mountain biking and then try to explain to them, well, you can go to Dryer Road or you can go to Whiting Road. And you know, I mean, unless you've been there and rode those, it's very difficult to know where you are. So like you say, you get to the trail and you're like, hmm, where, do, where do I, where do I go to? And hopefully there's somebody else out on the trail so that I can get maybe back to my car from when I leave. Um, <clears throat> so the simplicity of the course design, in my mind, is, is huge. I mean, like starting out with something that absolutely can work to everyone's favor by motorized getting stuff done. Yes, everybody loves to run their, their hand hoe and oh yeah, yeah, the guys build our mountain bike courses up at <clears throat> my parents' and neighbors' land that we only have available for, uh, that we have available because it's private land, it's all single track. And yet it put a trail that's two feet wide is a task. I mean, anybody that's ever built trails, um, <clears throat> it's, it's like 
it's crazy. So you need that machinery to come in, but also to make sure you've identified that course to meet everybody's point that make it as wide as possible because it will, <clears throat> I would almost say it'd never be too wide. Um, you can have some of those single track trails that could develop further down the line that might be more technical. Here's the base trail and then utilizing everything else that the golf cart paths, the paths are already there. Um, so it's not just maybe the 35 acres that it's only for mountain biking here, knowing that you can ride it everywhere. And yes, you go to any other trails, um, our, everybody knows that they're riding with other people out there. Um, our shop being in town of Parrington, we have the Crescent Trail Association and boy, heaven forbid, don't ride in that, <laughs> but everybody rides on it and you're getting yelled at and nobody wants to talk to each other. And yeah, that's a whole nother, we don't need to discuss that. But um, <clears throat> it generally are, are all kidding aside with that is that everybody is respectful of the trail. And there's there's certain times in the evening if you go to Dryer Road and there's an event going on. Yeah, it's much busier there. There's a lot of people that have gone to Victor New York because there's a mountain bike trail like and it's easy that you can get there there's great parking there's Athens. facilities I mean it's just it's a turnkey fairly close to the suburbs here I mean in uh, Tryon and Bay Park West and all this other stuff there's there's parking there's not ample parking there's not I don't know about what the facilities I haven't been there in a while there I don't think there are any they're um, not and when you have a six-year-old who comes and has to go to the bathroom yeah. it's yeah. really inconvenient yeah. so it's so though I think that component of it I mean it all it's not any different than you're building the soccer field you're going to have to have some facilities or whatever else you're putting in that facility piece is huge and it's a huge expense on the town too I mean building the trail is an expense but being able to clean it and maintain it it's it's big parking lots the whole thing so um i i love everything about it just opening up more trail opportunities for everyone um but utilizing more than just that 35 acre piece for inclusion and even on that 35 acre piece there is that true off-road trail that the person that is that skilled uh rider that is using an accessible bike but again you can't use it at drier road you can't make it around the turn it's it's in to build that whole new trail it, it's not easy um and it's expensive and yeah if and especially if you run wider bars at dryer you can't you don't want to do that too <laughs> uh, everything was built with a narrower bar and then bikes ended up with bars wider bars wider, yeah. 10 years <laughs> later and they've, they've worked on the trails but newer trails that are going in i mean they're meant to accommodate that or making sure if it's a one way that people pay attention to what's a one way and it's clearly defined so you're not running into somebody going down a trail or climb, trying to climb up but um but yeah I, I i mean all the stuff that's brought up and you guys as the volunteer in the time uh kudos to everyone that spends all their time working on their bikes riding their bikes getting people involved um it makes my job easier but it's also easier to get people out in the community and I have some ammunition for them, even if it's a simple flyer. The G Rock stuff, we hand that stuff out regularly and go to their website. It's got a map, and they're like, "Oh, great! I can get a little oriented before I get to the trail." That's that's phenomenal for somebody that's never been on the trail before, um, and try not to get them on something too crazy. Like, don't drive. Don't if it says this, don't go down that one. Oh, okay, and they might come back in and go, "Yeah, we started to go down that trail, and yeah, we turned around, or we were able to get off of it." it um, and Dryer Road, I guess, built in, you know, kind of that upper loop to make it kind of more beginner, but it's still all single track. It's not, you know, it's not this nice wide trail that um, would accommodate everyone to ride all the time. So. Thank you. And, and as you advertise how it's a multi-use will be essential too, because, you know, you're not going to call it a mountain bike park, right, specifically, because what I'm finding with my group that I did not even anticipate was there are about there were about 20 parents who ended up coming hiking me, with me one night because one parent said, oh, I didn't know we could walk up the hill <laughs> at Victor. And I was too pregnant to ride the last 10 months. So I took a bunch of people hiking every week and then they got to see all the kids in the park. They're, you know, they're not pe people that necessarily want a mountain bike yet, but maybe they will in a couple years. 
And I felt bad that for weeks they were just sitting in their car watching the kids go up the hill. And I, I said, I knocked on a window and I was like, what are you doing? You want to go for a walk? It's beautiful. They, and they said, I had no idea we were allowed to go for a walk. <laughs> No, the intent, the intent is to have it yeah. open for everybody, uh, every user, of course. I mean, and we talk about the turnouts or a rest area and things of that nature. That's all going to, you know, if we can facilitate that into the trail design. Um, no horses, though, right? Um, probably not horses. And I would no have horses. to look to... Uh, you said it. No horses. I was like, who's bringing no that up? <laughs> Thank goodness. That'd be really expensive to make yeah. it <laughs> hard enough for horses. That's why we have the Heberly Stables down on Broncroft. <laughs> Are you getting uh, requests for single track from, because I know you brought it back up, are you, have you had requests? That's why we're here this evening. I have not heard single track yet, except for, I mean, I could, you know, I, I'm prophesizing here, but as Doug kind of mentioned, um, there may be some of those riders that are out there that are going to be looking for that and want, the, and without design in hand, they may just pop up, unfortunately. Do you think, so, so those of you who have thought about that multi-purpose implement, implementing the elements into the wide trails for different skill level, is that, um, does that help folks that want single track or are they looking for that, the trees are crashing in around me you know, type I, of experience? I, I really think that, I mean, a four foot wide trail I think that still counts as single track. You're not going to have two riders side by side going down that trail. There's, it's just there's single track and then there's super tight single track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is just more accessible. You know, a lot of times you, you build that big bench and then, you know, there's a line that gets burned in that's a lot more narrow. But you could still safely use the whole mm -hmm. bench, you know, the whole width. Yeah, and it, it seems to me that there's more of the narrow tree branch, tree trunk kind of trails around here that if someone really, if that's what they really wanted, they could go do. Not yeah, there's, kind there's of, plenty of that. <laughs> but if we were really looking at this being something unique to the area that can be, you know, a really big asset for the town uh, because there's nothing else like it, it sounds like, to me, um, it that just that concept actually fulfills that need. Uh, for our region as a starter and then perhaps others will model after it really uh, because you're getting you're getting users you're getting a variety of users you're getting recognition for it etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I certainly uh, I would I would kind of reiterate that yeah like the the wider trail experience is probably the thing that is most needed around here um, but that doesn't preclude uh, single track trails from existing on this property, but it might be that they total a half mile and are just some small offshoots from the main trails. And that, that wouldn't be, uh, I would hope that that wouldn't be the primary design here and that there would be things that probably wouldn't even spring up and the, wouldn't even be part of the first phase, but maybe, maybe they are, maybe they're incorporated into the initial design. Um, but I, I do want to kind of go back to that uh, multiple, I, I guess the way that I would characterize it is the idea of having multiple experiences on the same trail for people. Um, so I, I do like the idea of having, you know, a feature, uh, you know, some kind of technical feature off of even one of the paved trails that, um, you know, if you're riding, especially with a young kid who's, who's just learning and you're an adult who's an expert rider, you can just go, pop off for five seconds and you can still have eyes on your kid the whole time that you're doing that. Um, I have, uh, you know, this is not to, to like to my own horn or anything like that, but I've, I've ridden trails all over the country, everything from, you know, super beginner trails to double diamond uh, trails that are, you know, some of the hardest ones that you can find in the country. I, when I go out on mountain biking trips with my buddies, that's what we're looking for. Um, but I can tell you that a well-designed trail, even a you know green circle trail can be an awful lot of fun if it is designed right. And this is where kind of the challenge comes in is, is that uh, you know professional trail builders are going to be able to build in multiple experiences into the same uh, trail. Uh, 
one of the most fun trips I've ever been on was uh, in June uh, this year after school ended, uh, myself and a handful of other parents brought our kids, and I think the age range was six to 13, uh, to Jake's Rocks in Pennsylvania. And I know that's not like a place you can just pop over and go check out. Um, but uh, you might be able to find some video and things like that. But those trails are built, they're machine built trails where the initial uh, bench is probably four to six feet wide in most places. Um, but you know, there's, there's vegetation and, and uh, rocks and things like that that kind of move in on the trail so that primarily you are on a single track trail, but there's not trees within five or six feet uh, in either direction. Um, but in addition to having a nice uh, flowy trail, you know, it's just got gentle rollers to it, um, there are features that are off to the side. So rather than having a feature that is a main, um, uh, you know, as part of the main trail, it is off to the side. So you actually have to go out of your way to do these features. And that was one of the most fun weekends I've ever had. Uh, riding, and I was riding primarily green circle trails and, and uh, blue square trails with my 10-year-old kid, who he can ride at a much faster speed because it's a lot more open. He's not worried about trees hitting him, and you know there's not super tight turns. Um, so we can actually ride at very similar speeds, like closer to what I would normally ride on these trails. But then if there's a rock pile or a jump or uh, you know, even just a cleverly slanted rock in the trail, I can go like jump off of that and do that kind of thing. And so we both get to do experiences that, that make us happy, but on the same trail at the same time, at the same speed, we get to ride with each other. Um, and, and now my, my son, you know, he's, he sees me doing that and he's starting to look for those, those rocks off to the side of the trail that might make it a little bit you know, more challenging for him. Um, so yeah, something like that is, is just a great model for how that can be done. One, one problem that actually solves, which I was sitting here thinking to myself like, okay, if you have like a big wide trail uh, and you have an advanced rider, he's probably gonna be, or she's probably gonna be riding really fast because there's nothing there to slow them down. So in, you know, if you're an advanced rider, you can see ahead really well and you can anticipate the trail. And if it's an easier trail, you can just pedal faster. And then what happens is you have people riding too fast, but that is a great example of how to distract those riders. Like slow down and hit that and that and that and that and that, and then it'll hopefully add basically as a speed bump, even though it's not in the middle of the trail, it acts as a functional speed bump because it's a distraction. Yeah, I never actually thought of that, about that, but that's absolutely what happens there, is that the more expert riders are going to have to slow down a little bit in order to get that feature off the side of the trail. So they're not just going 20 miles an hour down, down this trail. Which they could if they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I haven't spoken yet. I'd like to, I know we're kind of late on time, but you can go finish for, if you yeah, like. Yeah, go ahead, and, and go ahead, after. please. All right, thank you. My name is Scott Mackay. I'm a stewardship chair at GRAC, Tennessee Regional Off-Road Cyclist. I've been mountain biking for pretty, pretty much my whole life, um, in one way or another, BMX, uh, road riding too, all that stuff. Um, lately, uh, recently I you know, got more involved with GRAC and took some uh, trail construction classes and trail design and just really appreciate a really nice built trail and all the facilities that go with it. Um, in Monroe County, there's 21 county parks, two of which you can mountain bike in legally. They're not just mountain bike parks, they're shared use trails, but they're the only two parks in Monroe County. We have Whiting Road, which is a town park. You can mountain bike there, Dryer Road, OCP, Stid Hill, um, some of the places down south. But the opportunity here is, is great, and everyone has said something that I wanted to say, so I'm not gonna go and rehash all that stuff, but, um, I think the progressive nature that we're all talking about, allowing opportunities for, for beginners of all abilities, or you know, beginners and, and being able to progress and um, you know, learn more about biking, um, the Shadow Pines property provides ample terrain to do that. Um, and I like the idea of having all the trails, or you know, the paved trails and stuff available too on the north side. One word I haven't heard um, is fat biking and grooming of fat bike trails. Um, 
that's an activity that happens in the winter. There are not many places to do it around here. Um, Whiting Road gets used enough where the trails become rideable, but um, I know down in Western New York at Long Point, Harris Hill, I think in Ellicottville, they are grooming their trails in the winter. Um, that is such fun uh, that I'm really surprised it hasn't actually happened around here. But I'd like to just, you know, point that out that that's an opportunity that we have here. Um, and because Monroe County only has two parks that you can uh, mountain bike in, and it wasn't really stood up as a county park like initiative. It was a grassroots motion, you know, um, activity that, you know, was born out of people that love mountain biking and probably have a higher skill level than the average biker. So the, the trails at the, the parks are a little more advanced in the, because they're built by people who like to ride that stuff. Um, but here is, is an opportunity to build from the ground up, you know, what we're all talking about and do it right and make it a place that it would be um, outstanding. And, and, you know, and I don't and, know. I'd, and those green trails are great for fat biking too. Yes. Like that's one of the challenges with Bay Park West and Tryon trying to fat bike in there is this just too technical, you know, too steep and, but. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. awesome point. Yeah. And then the you know a skills area was one of the things I did want to talk about. Talk about. I didn't hear. Um, I, I used to race mountain bikes, but I, I don't. I, I enjoy. I would enjoy doing it, but I just don't have the time. But cyclocross racing is also quite popular, and they have a cyclocross like skills area mm. with, with those barriers or steps, and you know there's plenty of other things that I don't know about, but just the, you know. A cyclocross like practice area would be, I think, would be a, a great pull, and just get a lot of you know attention and use. Um, and I so, second uh, that. Good job bringing that up. Yeah, <laughs> two you, awesome points. If you're not familiar with cyclocross, it's um, it's basically a road bike with skinny knobby tires that you. Uh, it's a it's like a ten foot wide course the whole way through. It's usually like a one and a half mile closed loop. It's basically like um, uh, rally car racing on a bicycle. Uh, so, but practically speaking, a cyclocross course it would would fit some of the description we're going after as well. It, it could serve multiple purposes, is my point. Um, well, if Penfield is, I mean, Penfield is currently running high school cross country races in there. Is that? Is that correct? Yeah, and so a course like that could easily be adapted to a cyclocross course as well. So mm -hmm. there'd be a good opportunity for that. Cyclocross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I forgot, I, I'm a recent Penfield resident too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Welcome to Penfield. <laughs> I do want to reiterate Scott's point about uh, the fat biking too. It's it's an absolute blast. I took my kids out this winter um, riding, and they they had so much fun doing it. But the uh, what you would think of as a pretty intermediate hill, when you add snow, um, becomes very difficult. Wow. So uh, generally, uh, fat bikers we in the winter, we're looking for areas that are much flatter, uh, with gentler terrain, and the normal mountain biking obstacles can become impassable sometimes in yeah. the winter. Yeah, so like the uh, north well. part of Shadow Pines would be great for fat biking, especially yeah. if it was groomed. And it can all be shared with, with cross-country skiing as well, yeah, especially and with... And well, good not moves. on my cross-country ski, nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Walkers, so. walkers snowshoers, and, and uh, uh, fat tire bikers are a, hmm. That's a cross-country skier's nightmare. Yeah, uh, they, it happens down in we, we definitely uh, down in um, to do a to do a true cross-country ski though you want just two you want two tracks and this is the challenge I have over to Ellison too. If you go cross-country skiing in Ellison, I make my own trails, and the next thing I know, I have the snowshoers that went over my trail. So the next day I go there, I can't ski on it any longer yeah. because I have now these big footprint. <laughs> that just destroyed my, my trail. Right. So it's it, an education it, thing too. That yeah. we it is, but it's also a combination. Everybody's going to be out here, and we're going to have. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know that I know where I'm skiing. I know where I ski. I know where the hills are. I know how to get there. And I can get back in that back area and not sing and see another single soul until the next day when the snowshoer comes through or the fat bike guy comes through or somebody walking their dog comes through and destroys the trail. But that's, we've <laughs> talked about actually grooming for skiing as well. Um, so if there's a grooming technique that has to be done for the fat bikes, we have all the asphalt trails out there that could easily accommodate, but you're gonna be running into the same a similar situation. Yeah. A similar situation. You groom for one activity, another person, another user is going to utilize yeah. that. So it's one of those we all have to we, yeah. we are all going to have to work together and use the same trails for the different the different purposes. Right. But so I I've been cross country skiing since I was 14 racing and uh, and stuff like that. And and that has certainly there was a time, especially when I was racing, where that that was much more of a conflict between walkers and skiers, and uh, now uh, fat bikers and snowshoers and stuff like that. But one of the areas I've I've seen it handled well is um, up in Lake Placid, some areas in Vermont. Uh, they have good signage that actually shows you on a sign uh, where the skiers should be on the trail, where fat bikers and snowshoers uh, should be on a trail. And I will say that um, as a fat biker, when I go out where people have snowshoed, once it starts to get packed down, that's yeah. actually some of the best Yeah, riding. snowshoeing is uh, excellent so grooming fat for fat biking. biking. They, they go kind of hand in hand, go yeah. Hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and especially if that can happen before people start walking on it, then it gets packed down and it doesn't get post hold. Right. right. Um, well, so. I mean, ideally you'd have a groomer out early yeah. and then it'd be great for everybody right away. Yeah. But it would be it would be more like on the the skating trails, not necessarily the classic trails. Because yeah, classic you do like to have those you know those two tracks. Um, but to some extent, too, uh, you can't stop human nature. Nope. If there's good trails there that people can ride or snowshoe or walk on, um, the walking especially I, I can tell you as a, as a cross country skier just destroys cross country ski trails. But you can't stop people from walking on. Trails. See, I've tried, gonna... to make, I've tried to make the trails in such, uh, even down amended ponds, put them in the back. I go off the trail all the time to yeah. try to find my own way down and yeah, through. Say, so, and the next so day, people go, have yeah. been walking in it. It's like, oh. Go to go to amended ponds and go to Harriet Hollister and go find places where nobody's been, and right. then you can make your own tracks. All right, I know we're at eight, almost 8.30. Um, I just wanted to, and this is all great. Thank you very, very much for all of this input. I think part of the next whole process here is, I think we can, we can digest an awful lot of this information and we can come up with a, a very schematic level of, okay, we want a pump track, we want skills areas, we want these elements incorporated within what we're calling the mountain biking. And in reality, it's biking uh, in, in this area. Um, <clears throat> but I think part of discussions that we have to have next, and maybe not for tonight, um, are actually, okay, who's gonna design these? And they have to be designed to a specific criteria. And we have a lot of input here, and so we have to have a, a designer of this trail network that could assist the town or assist a group to come up with a true design. Uh, it's very similar to what is occurring right now in the disc golf course. Um, that I am, I have, we have facilitated the disc golf group to come together to design a course and get a course laid out here. And I think that's probably one of the next steps that has to occur is now that we know what the elements are, we can take a shot on how they might lay out as it relates to access, vehicular access, pedestrian access, getting to these spaces. Um, but we've got to now embrace a trail designer to come in to assist in doing this. The next piece of that puzzle, of course, and it was identified a little earlier, uh, there's a cost involved. Um, and as part of that cost, where's the money coming from? I'm gonna be very honest. I mean, we need to, we need to facilitate, how do we get funding to make this happen? Um, 
and I know that we might have grants for some of the accessibility options, um, but are there other grants that are available? Is there funding from each of your organizations that might uh, be able to assist in paying for a designer or paying for maintenance or somehow helping fund getting this stuff done? Um, and I think the, and Jim, please, please tell me to stop if I overstep my bounds, but um, I think the, the town board and the town supervisor are very open to all of these improvements here. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there's tight budgets at the municipal level and at the town level. So any type of funding that could be done by private organizations or fundraising opportunities that, that this group or individual groups has, uh, we need to take a look at that and, and a hard look at that. Uh, these are all great ideas, but somehow and, and, we and, and Andrew, we, we may, as, as the town, you know, you talked about the machinery type aspect of it. We may have, have the ability to do that once we know what we're doing and how it's laid out. Um, I'm certain that DPW could certainly help along the way, but again, it does come down to design features and you know, how's, how's it all gonna get paid for and designed out? That's right. the big thing. Right. Jim, is, is there any opportunity for the town to, to fund any of this kind of stuff? Well, right now we're in the process of funding a pickleball complex. We're in the process of funding a disc golf complex. Um, you guys are the third ones in, I don't know. And uh, I think a lot of this too is being done by, by the, uh, the various agencies that, are, that want these things in place. Um, we do have people in the pickleball world that want to contribute. We have people in the disc golf world that want to contribute. So it's, it's gonna be a, a partnership of some, point, of some type as we go down the road on this thing. And I think the town is um, the towns will the town will be developing the parking and the access and getting people to the site uh, by by installing parking lots and putting up pavilions and things of that nature. Um, but this is a and just like the disc golf course, this is a a, a separate entity, if you will. Um, so I, I I know that we will continue to reach out to everybody as we kind of develop this along a little bit further. Um, but I would ask you to think about how might we be able to progress a little bit further. Could I, could I ask a question? I, I know, Eric, you've been involved in this since day one, so I know you know that area really well. Has anybody else been out there just to kind of, you know, conceptually visualize out there what you thought might be the appropriate layouts or locations of, of uh, paths to get through or trails to get through? Or is that just too premature at this point in time for a lot of you? I mean, I've been out there a lot, but I haven't like stomped around in the woods looking at like, oh, where would the line go? Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's kind of what I was asking. Is I, yeah. I have. Have you? Yeah, and I. Do you have ideas I, as to what you I, think would be? I brought a map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Scott. But, but, I, but I took the liberty to, to design the whole South Park. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow, did you bring any money with you? <laughs> <laughs> Couple bucks. Well, I think it'd be helpful, uh, Andrew, you certainly want to look at this and see what's, you know, what the advantages are of looking at that layout and yeah. seeing it, how it fits. Yeah, I definitely would love to, if you could share that with me, that'd be fantastic. Um, Absolutely. I, I go back to a little bit of an earlier comment that I have. We have a trail network here that we can utilize for biking. I'm not calling it mountain biking, I'm calling it biking. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to really take a look at utilizing all of that trail network, for, which I believe can facilitate the beginner biker and then develop that mountain bike, the true mountain bike area, kind of as a separate entity. Okay, we have, because there's, there's gonna be the fat tire bikers that are gonna come out here on these trails. We're gonna have the ability to, there's a trail network that exists now that you throw a bike on, you could have a lot of fun on. Yeah. So. I do just wanna point out right now, it is not, you're not allowed to bike in there, correct? I'm sorry, uh, what was There's it? no biking in there right now. No, you can take your bike in if you wanted yeah. to. Oh, when I first checked, like there's a bike rack at the front and I thought, I read online, no biking. Oh, we've, Which we've, we've was really disappointing people. and then worried me as we move forward of how we have multi-use area to all together because if 
if I, I live here and I'm a cyclist, I looked it up, I'll look again, but it, initially it said no biking and that's why I thought there was a bike rack at the trail place where Clark House is. I'll check into that for you and see. Yeah. I, I, I believe that we're allowing that to occur now. Okay. But um, so my, my partner is much more of a canal cyclist. I took him to Whiting Road with my son and he was like, oh, I would consider biking in here, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> that <laughs> was like, oh, this sounds kind of cool. Um, but he, I would never take him to these other places because <laughs> we have to live together. <laughs> But anyway, I'm, I'm concerned about this biking aspect. We'll check into that for okay. you. Um, I've had to, we've had to take a couple of people out that had dirt bikes in oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's probably Different what we mean is we don't want bikes. that kind of biking. Yeah. We don't allow bikes. any motorized uh, biking in any of our parks, let alone right. that site. Yeah. And I would add, when we've done the, our mountain bike course, I'll, again, private, had a 1.8 mile loop. And since we've been, a have the ability we have 80 acres that we're using now but it was about 35 which that grew to about a two and a half three mile loop and now it's five and a half miles of trail that came off the existing like two mile loop that was there originally so the stuff that's already built i mean you go oh yeah we want to go this way and then come back out to it but you still have maybe that main trail that that you could ride on uh, when people show up to mountain bike race, they don't see anything else except for this, so they don't even know where they are most of the time. But when we've had some uh, like work days and uh, more or less free rides out there, they're like, wow, I never knew this trail was like this and how close you are to mm -hmm. right next to the next trail that you could cross over. Um, but we just have one continuous loop in there now, but it's that long that's built off of what was there. So that established trail absolutely, I think should, and, and I don't know, uh, with your map has some of that added in, but like where you're not just like having to reimagine everything. You, there's stuff there that hey, that works pretty good too, and can work with. Yeah, I mean the, so. the whole the whole intent is utilize what we have yeah. and then break off of what is there to do some of these other things. I mean, which offsets offset a lot of costs <clears throat> too. Yep, um, and I guess the, the the thought process initially was that that southwest corner, that this could facilitate a little bit more of the intermediate to a more advanced rider because of some of the slopes that are in there. I know we're not gonna go straight down these things. I know that there's some steep slopes in there, uh, but there, I've walked through it and there's actually opportunities to be able to get in a four or five foot wide flat zone coming down and through and rerouting and, and coming back up. Um, so that should be incorporated into the overall biking schematic. So let me interrupt just for a second. I just had one of my coworkers let me know that our town code does not allow for biking right now in those town parks. So that would obviously have to change as part of this process. And the other question I had is, did Andrew, did everybody sign up and give us their contact information, like emails and stuff? We have everybody's email everybody's? that I could share with you. Absolutely, because I do want, well, yep. in case everybody we need to get a hold of anybody, that'd be great. Laura, to his question about um, professionals that have the, the knowledge and, and experience doing what people have been conceptualizing, is that something, and maybe others too, that you know uh, that we could provide them with options? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Adam knows designers and professional bell build, trail builders and, and also for funding too, I think, um, I know IMBA does matching grants, and um, I think there are other sources of funding that we can, I don't know off the top of my head, but <laughs> I'll talk to him. It's too bad. Yeah, I wanted to point out, uh, Grok does have some experience with uh, fundraising and uh, grant writing as well. We have gotten some grants from REI over the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, we're not, you know, by any means experts at it, but uh, we do have some experience there, and so there's, there's an opportunity for both fundraising and and uh, grant writing. Um, I just do want to bring up one other uh, quick thing about the the overall um, cart path biking. There are some spots, especially um, in the very southwest corner, um, and on the uh, I guess you want to call it the northwest side of the bridge that crosses the creek down there, that 
would actually be pretty dangerous for a more of a beginner cyclist. And they wouldn't necessarily, you know, without signage or something to tell them what's, what's coming, they wouldn't, they could find themselves back there and in kind of a hairy situation. That um, uh, serpentine downhill coming down to the bridge I mean, um, it, is, is that paved? It is paved. But it's still dangerous for like- But it's, even, it's yeah. so steep and it is, yeah. it is covered, it's, it's like green almost right now because it's covered in, in moss. And so somebody who doesn't understand good braking can easily find themselves sliding out on that and now you're sliding on pavement on your skin and that's not fun. Um, also crossing that bridge, um, you definitely, you have to go straight across that bridge. If you find yourself coming in a little too hot into that bridge and hit the brakes, it's also an ice rink. It's a, it's a uh, forced technical trail feature. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then a couple of the, uh, a couple of the, the uh, downhill sections back there are so steep, uh, sometimes with mud on the trail at the bottom that they would also be dangerous for people. So that, that would be something that I would personally want to see either just completely removed um, or with some kind of signage um, telling people about what is coming up, maybe even a, a, um, a forced corral at the top of uh, that hill going down to the bridge so that people have to get off their bikes uh, to walk down it because the first time they do it, they may not realize what's, what's coming. Uh, it's a pretty hard turn and you can find yourself doing 20 miles an hour down that hill if you're not on your brakes in a, in a real hurry. Yeah, so. I believe there used to be, uh, I don't know if it still existed, there used to be cart pass signs there too. It's, yeah. It's, you had to go slow. Um, and riding, riding a yeah, cart, path, a, yeah, riding a cart, a cart down there was hairy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Even with the governor on, so. <laughs> right now there is actually no biking in that area. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So it really is not allowed per Oops. Uh, I, I have seen people ride their bikes over there. So. Oh, people do ride I mean, their bikes. We, yeah, we don't have somebody the standing there yeah. ready to but, take your bike away from but you. That's but that's where we run into issues with the Crescent Trail. Crescent Trail. Because, right. yep. because that's where our community yeah. clashes. And it's, yeah. you know, the people who are walking and, ha and frustrated with the bikers are actually right. Yeah. And so that's, that's where we're going to have an issue with our community truly embracing these trails. Because right now we've set ourselves up for a, a struggle. Yeah. So well, I, I do not bike in there. I do not let my partner bike in there because I said it's not against, it's against the rules. Yeah. Well, it, those I, rules will change, obviously. I, I know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the, the, uh, the advisory committee to the Shadow Pines before it was purchased uh, recommended biking in here. We have recommended that, that this is an element for this park area. Um, so the town would like to move forward with this. We get enough interest in people involved that we will make it happen. I say we, it's a collective we can make this happen. Uh, I, I, I go back to the disc golf too. I mean, this is, that's a we. There was a number of individuals that were involved with, we want disc golf. It was recommended in the advisory reports in the master conceptual master plan. And now it is becoming a reality. Uh, because we have some individuals that have continued to push and push it forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's quite honestly what everybody here in this room is going to have to continue to do to push this forward, uh, to keep it go moving forward mm -hmm. so that we don't lose momentum and we can actually see this as a real area for biking. So, so the, what are the next steps on that then? I think then that's exactly where I was going to go, so thank you. Um, what I would really like to do uh, and see kind of see by a show of hands, I'd like to go out and walk that site with everybody um, if they're available. Maybe do it on a weekend. Um, uh, Council member Debbie Draw has voiced uh, um, that she would like to attend and walk the site with us. Uh, and I know her husband is a, I believe he's part of Grok not mistaken. Uh, so Steve is a, he's a, a biker um, and Debbie is a biker as well. So I'd um, like to go and walk that section and really down in that southwest section, we can walk all of it if, if you want, but I want to concentrate a little bit more in the areas that are undeveloped at this point that don't have the existing cart paths uh, to 
to kind of take the information that we have today and how do we map this out? And you know, any information that you might be able to provide in your mapping, Scott, I'd mm -hmm. love to have that. Um, but go walk the site and really see what, what we can put out here um, and the reality of the space that we're contending with. Um, and then from that point, it's coming up with a conceptual layout for where all these elements might be, um, and kind of throwing out some of the ideas that we've heard today. Um, and then when it comes to the actual design of each trail, that's where we need to get a professional in. Um, we need to hire a professional trail designer to come in to assist to facilitate a real design that incorporates all of the, uh, the elements, incorporates all the criteria that we need to uh, follow. Um, and then after that point, it really, I believe, it does become a fundraising activity to a certain degree in grassroots. Uh, I would think that having a number of different organizations represented, uh, maybe it's one, one or a few different grant applications that can go in, but if, if this entire group could come together and say, we have Grok, we have Roots, we have Accessible Adventures, we have everybody involved, and we're looking for this grant, I would think that you may have a better chance. Yeah, of they love something. partnerships. Yeah. And if we can, and if we can do that on a collective scale, then I think that we can. We have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so what I what I would be doing, we would be doing, either here from me or from from um, Bob Jones, is kind of scheduling a, a site walk, maybe on a Saturday, um, over the course of the next two or three weeks. I'd like to get and take and digest the information that I have here, do a little bit of my own research a little bit further, um, kind of take a look at some of these other parks that were, were mentioned uh, and the attributes they have. Um, and then more on this walk, be able to kind of talk this through a little bit further. So if you all would be willing to go on a little bit of a walk, I saw, I saw thumbs up, heads, heads nodding. Mm -hmm. We will be in contact via email, um, and we'll copy the town in, of course, um, and we'll set something up to, to do this next, next round to take a look at it you know, in person. Thanks. Yeah? Thanks. I really want to thank everybody for showing up. This, is, this has been great. There's a really, really good input, um, and I think uh, most of us are all on the same page here, which is a positive. Um, there was no, Bob, there was no pitchforks, nor were there torches. <laughs> so that, that, that makes for a very good meeting. <laughs> Unlike other recent situations? <laughs> Unlike other recent situations. So I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, and you can, you can contact us. You have our emails because we've, we've reached out. There are a couple other individuals that were on our overall list that we will include in those, uh, in our correspondence. Um, but now we'll get you all collective into one, uh, one large email going out, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for accommodating. Yes.